Newsmakers. More than a billion dollars in grants and gifts. That's how much the Rhode Island Foundation steered to nonprofits statewide since Neil Steinberg took the helm in 2008. Now the president and CEO of the foundation is preparing to step down, waiting to take over outgoing Congressman David Cicilline. This week on Newsmakers, the exit interview with the Rhode Island Foundation's Neil Steinberg. Welcome to Newsmakers, I'm Tim White. Joining me on the panel is Target 12 investigator Eli Sherman, Neil Steinberg, President and CEO from the Rhode Island Foundation. Welcome back to the program, good to have Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I should note that the Rhode Island Foundation is an underwriter of Newsmakers and we appreciate the support. Mm -hmm. So you pass a baton to Congressman Cicilline on June 1st, 15 years at the Rhode mm -hmm. Island Foundation. How are you feeling? Uh, I'm feeling um, bittersweet, obviously. Uh, enjoyed it. It's the best job I've ever had, and I never worked so hard in my life. At the same time, we won't tell at, Fleet Bank you said that. Yeah, right. Well, <laughs> um, and uh, I'm looking forward to taking the summer off and just relaxing a little after uh, doing all this. Well, but, before um, we get to your mm -hmm. your future and what mm -hmm. what you might want to do, uh, we're taping this program on Thursday morning, so you're farewell address of your final annual meeting at the mm -hmm. Rhode Island Foundation was last night. Correct. You gave a speech uh, to everybody, and you listed off a series of challenges that Rhode Island is facing. What do you put at the top of that list? Yeah, you know, that's a good question because the, the top is crowded, right? So we can't house people right now because housing's at a premium. Our education uh, system we know needs to improve. 67% of the kids that take the RICAS test can't, don't score proficiently in reading. Uh, we have a behavioral health crisis uh, off the charts and mental health and substance abuse. And the hard part is while they are, I believe, top challenges, they're also top national challenges in yeah, a lot of cases. Yeah, it's not unique to Rhode Island. Co correct. And so I think you know, when you add those together, um, quality of life and our future workforce and investing in our youth, those are the, at the top of the heap. Uh, my encouragement, though, is we got to stop talking about these things and start doing more about them. Do you feel like state leaders have been too slow to get off the dime on, on some of these issues? I, I think the state is too slow, and so I'm not going to pin on the state leaders. I talked last night about bureaucracy and a can-do versus a can-not-do mentality. There are places where it's easier to do business. There are places where you get uh, things done quicker. That's what we need, less bureaucracy, more focus on results. Well, let's uh, dig into some of these issues. I want to talk about housing, which is one of the mm -hmm. issues that you raised. The foundation recently put out a report showing that Rhode Island needs 24,000 new housing units to address the state's affordability crisis. Uh, in 2021, the Rhode Island produced only about 1,100 new housing units. So what's the single biggest issue, in your opinion, that's preventing the state from creating more housing? Yeah, so the first thing is, is I think, realizing the problem, which leaders do. So the governor, the speaker, it's at the top of the agenda. Um, I'll admit, you know, I know a lot of stuff. I've been around. But when I read that report that for several years we had the lowest housing production in the United States, that's pretty startling, yeah. right? Why should we do that? So we weren't paying attention enough on the, the pending need. Um, what we need to do is, you know, we need to locate, we need to negotiate, we need to, to get projects going and shovels in the ground. And I get zoning and I get not in my backyard and I get this commission and that commission. That's what I think the speaker's bills that he put in are trying to streamline some of that. But we need units. We need homes. We need rental units. We need supportive housing for the homeless. It's right in front of us. It's an imperative to get shovels in the ground because things take a while. Were there areas of the country that were particularly effective um, in dealing with this? I don't know if the report looked at yeah, that. Yeah, it looks, there's a, on, on individual suggestions, there's a lot of best practices. But, you know, I even look, and, and I hate to do the comparison, I just like it because it's warmer in Florida. Um, it's not all luxury housing. I go down there, my son lives there, and I visit, and I see things about affordable housing. And they're just able to get things streamlined and decisions streamlined that we seem to be hung up on that this group or that commission or that. There's just too many levels of bureaucracy. Well, they also opinion. have far more geography than Correct. we are. We're the most densely Correct. populated state in the United States. Right. right. So. But we could drive around and we could find places where you could locate apartment units 20, 30 and put them here, there. We've got to reuse. Reuse is big. We've got to look at state properties, institutional properties, see where we can reuse it. Some places you read about malls with housing. In New York City, you read about uh, housing in office buildings now. Hmm. 
Um, switching gears a little yeah. bit, looking at education, uh, another thing that you brought up, test scores last year showed that two thirds of Rhode Island students right. were not proficient in right. math or English language learning. Um, or English language arts, excuse right. me. So what is the state getting wrong right now when it comes to education? Huh. Uh, we're not getting the results that we need. Um, I, I, I can't give you a full diagnosis. What I suggested in the remarks last evening is though, let's focus on some of these things and pull out all the stops. So my recommendation, uh, just coming up with, with what we need on the reading side was, let's dedicate ourselves to getting every kid in the state up to grade level reading in three years. And whether that's technology or that's tutoring or it's getting every college student into the, the K through 12 classrooms to help and every business getting people to volunteer to help with reading and stuff, multi-language learners addressing that, parents. But let's set a goal and let's go whole hog to get every kid at first grade, fifth grade, 11th grade reading at grade level and become the only state in the country where 100% of our kids are reading and graduating with that proficiency. Otherwise, two thirds, where do you get your workforce from? What about the state constitution? There is no mm. constitutional guarantee in Rhode Island to yeah. a public education here. Right. Massachusetts does have one and everyone Correct. always points to Massachusetts as the yeah. you know public education system in the country. Is that critical? Do you yeah. think and why? If you, if you think so, tell me sure. why. Sure, so I think um, uh, you know, we've, got, we've had this long-term planning group going in education and health for a long time with key leaders. You know, the commissioners there, the, the union heads are there, the superintendents, et cetera. And we made a recommendation to state leaders this year to address uh, the teacher workforce, to address teacher professional development, uh, the funding formula and, and also that constitutional right. And we do think it's very important if for no other reason than, than um, kind of holding that over everybody that we owe all of everybody's children a constitutional right to a good education and be able to use that. You don't want to threaten lawsuits, but there's always behind that that you have recourse. Well, it was a lawsuit in Massachusetts, Massachusetts right. that, that prompted change. Yeah. And, and we've had the speaker on the show many times. Right. He doesn't like it. No, I know that. And, and he doesn't like it. And he has some very specific and good reasons. But we think it's just critical. We think those reasons can be worked with. And remember, Massachusetts started in 1993 mm -hmm. and, and have now that top results in the United States. Um, we've got to do this now. One of the comments I made last night related to housing, relates to education, relates to, to all of this about what we need to do. It's a Chinese proverb. The best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is now. <laughs> now, now is the time. We can't talk about what we didn't do for 20 years. Providence gets a lot of focus yeah. when in, in the education yeah. discussion. Do you support the state's continued takeover of Providence public schools? I'll put it another way. I don't support Providence taking it back till we see what their plan is. So just the idea of give it back to us, we're going to do better without knowing what they're going to do, how they're going to address the, the shortfalls, how they're going to address some of the, uh, the other issues. Uh, I would not recommend doing it until there's that plan. Once they have that plan and we're convinced they're going to do it, you talked about Massachusetts. Um, Lawrence Mass was, was one of the models for taking over. Lawrence Mass is in discussions with the state now about taking it back, mm -hmm. the very specific plan. Mayor Wu was threatened with taking her schools away from her when she first came until she did, and her staff in did Boston. a plan. In yeah. Boston, yeah, mm -hmm. and did a plan. I haven't seen a Providence plan, and maybe it's being worked on, but I think that's what's needed. Does that take the state off the hook a little bit, though? What does the state need to be doing right now to try and improve the schools while the city's trying to come up with a yeah, plan to it, take it back? Yeah, it's a great point. And, and you know, I have to say, and, and I don't think it's an excuse, but that asterisk of COVID is always there. So looking at why it didn't approve more for the last three years, um, I think the, the, the change in the schools and uh, the number of kids, which is smaller population, trying to recruit teachers is a bear. Uh, Providence is an 80 to 90 percent uh, uh, kids of color who are in the schools and the teachers are like 10 percent. We actually started a program to recruit and retain teachers of color. So I think it's a lot of the basics when you talk about education and getting in there and doing that. But uh, you know, we're not where we want to be as we know. And so you have to say it, whatever the it is, has not worked the way it was intended again around COVID and again around a lot of things. I want to uh, zoom out on the Rhode Island Foundation and actually your time there. You, you told a story last night about um, 
you know, one of your, your favorite donations that the foundation ever received. And the Rhode Island Foundation has received a lot of money, mm -hmm. but this one stood out to you. Can you retell that? Yeah, sure. So we've raised $700 million in the last 15 years, and it's a lot of money. And we have very large donors sometimes of all sizes. But during COVID in early 2020, when, when it was first heating up, Governor Raimondo called us, said, can you help raise some money? Because we know there's going to be issues. People are going to have challenges with housing, with food and all that. I said, sure. We raised $20 million in nine months. But I was sitting in my office one day and I got a call from a woman who told me she lived in a nursing home and she wanted to contribute $1 to help people in need. How could she get it to us? So after thanking her profusely, I had somebody drive. And hundreds else other than wanting to help. So that's money in the door, right. money out the door, $800 million right. in grants, $700 million in gifts, $1.5 million, a ton of money there. In your time at the Rhode Island Foundation, what stands out as the most effective use of that philanthrop uh, philanthropy? So what are the uh, responsibilities and challenges we have? We're by far the largest and most comprehensive funder. I say that humbly because I wish we were the 10th largest funder. I wish there were nine other large national or regional funders here, but we have to do it. So I think in addition to making impact in certain areas, education, I'd say health area, health, uh, economic security, it's the fact that we're broad supporters of all the sectors. So the arts, we do not forsake. We support environmental issues, basic human needs. We're very broad and I believe that Remember, we fund nonprofit organizations who actually do the boots on the ground work. And I believe we touch everybody in Rhode Island. And that's what I'm most proud of, that we're here for, of, and by the people of Rhode Island to be their community foundation. As a former president of Fleet, in many ways, you've brought a banker's mindset to growing the foundation. Your successor, David Cicilline, is a lawyer and politician by trade. Uh, what kind of mindset do you think he'll be bringing to leading the foundation? I think what we share and I actually got this in my years as a banker, and I think he's fully developed commitment to the community. That's it. So uh, I view, and David and I have talked about this a lot, his experience as mayor to me is a lot more relevant than as congressman because he's used to dealing and knows a lot of the community groups around. Uh, he's been a presence across the state at events and, and speaking to different community groups. So I think that passion, commitment, to the community and to community groups and to serving Rhode Island. I mean, you know, you can say what you want about politicians, but elected officials are, are public servants and they serve their constituents. Sure, but any concern about the partisanship and how that might affect, say, fundraising? Yeah, so that was one of the first things. Obviously, and I was not directly involved in the search or decision, but that's what came up early on is by definition, David's been partisan every day of his career and, and that's part of the job. We are not partisan. You know, I tell people we're purple. And uh, we're honest brokers and we're here to convene and, and get people uh, at the table. And so that was a big issue. Um, I believe David was on your show saying that he would not be part of it. There would be a nonpartisan David Cicilline. And he knows that. Whether he gets dragged into it or not, he will try right, we'll and prevent see. that. He's which been you in guys that, will do. <laughs> swimming right. in that pool well, for a long correct. time. <laughs> but on a day-to-day -day basis with our donors who, who you know, come in all shapes and forms and flavors, it really is demonstrating the work and the needs, you know, our, our whole being being, our whole mission is to meet the needs of all the people of Rhode Island. As long as we're focused on that, partisanship goes away. We're overdue for a break, Anil, mm -hmm. but before I let you go, we do want to look forward. You said you're taking the summer off. Mm -hmm. You're not the type of guy I know uh, to sit still. What are you going to do? So uh, I'm not going to play golf. I'm not a golfer. I'm not going <laughs> to feed the pigeons in the park. But I'm going to take the time to just take a look at what I'm, I'm going to do. Um, I may do some things, you know, with the with some of the elected officials on commissions and, and projects. I may write a little, you know, I may substitute teach to see what's going on in the schools. How about run for office? No. Oh, straight up no. No, not even no, remotely. No, I've been approached before, as a lot of people have. And, you know, when I was in this job, I thought I could get more stuff done in this job. Didn't have the state bureaucracy and stuff to deal with. And um, 
Uh, I'm very, very happy supporting our leaders and helping them do things, but it's not something I have an appetite for. Neil Steinberg, President and CEO of the Rhode Island Foundation. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate your service over the last 15 Thank you years. very much. All right, appreciate when we come back, your right to know and why access to government is facing roadblocks. Justin Silberman from the New England First Amendment Coalition. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White, riding shotgun Eli Sherman this week. And our guest for the second half is the exec executive director of the New England First Amendment Coalition, Justin Silverman. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. In full disclosure, I've been a board member of NEFAC since 2010. Um, and I want to begin with something that the group has been working on. Um, ne we call the First Amendment Coalition, NEFAC, by that acronym throughout the show. Uh, you and other organizations have been working to overhaul the state law that governs the public's right to access government materials. We do not have enough time to go through all of the proposed changes, but what are some of marquee changes in the statute that are being proposed? Yeah, let me first by saying it's been over a decade since we've last reformed. I was part of the 2012 <laughs> effort, yes. Yeah, it's been a, this reform has been a long time coming, so we have a great opportunity here to make some changes. And there are a number of changes, won't go into all of them, but there are a couple that are really important that I think deserve everyone's attention. Uh, the first is on police records, making sure that when police make arrests, when they're operating in our communities, we're getting information about their operations, making sure that we have all the information that we need as members of the public to know that they're acting within our best interest. And this bill will help give us more information about those arrests and those initial arrest reports. It will provide us better, quicker access to body camera footage from police officers. So that's the first thing. Uh, and then similarly, there's a, another provision in the law that will make it easier to access 911 calls, the audio of them. And this is uh, you know, a sensitive uh, topic because these 911 calls, you know, as, as you know, can be um, you know, these are the most you know, traumatic experiences mm -hmm. in an individual's life when they're calling 911. Uh, someone that they know or that they're in the company of needs medical services. They call up, they are asking for help. Uh, what we need to know as a public is whether they're getting the help that they're actually asking for, whether we have somebody competent on the other end of the line that can give them the services they need. And right now it's very difficult to get access to those calls, not just for you know, general public, but for the families of loved ones who have passed away, who were the people needing those calls to be made to begin with. It's very difficult to get access and accountability. So that's another thing that this bill will provide is access to those 911 calls, as well as increased transparency within law enforcement agencies. And those calls are public record, we should point out in, in Massachusetts, say you can access those and um, scrutinize them as many news outlets in the public ha has done. And, and you have that unique perspective as the head of, a, of NEFAC where you, you can see other state public records laws and, you know, as NEFAC does a, um, a lot of, goes to bat for a lot of members of the public and, and for the press. How does Rhode Island compare? And I should, as we talk about this, I should point out that NEFAC does a lot of work in this arena and we should point people to uh, the organization's website where you, for the six New England states, they can click on Maine, they can click on New Hampshire. We have it on the screen now, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and people can learn and you help them navigate the different public records laws. But to my original question, how does Rhode Island compare to the other six New England states? Yeah, so uh, short answer, middle of the road. Every state has its own public records law. They're all different. Some are stronger or weaker in some respects and in others. But I will say, you know, as far as those two things that I just mentioned, more transparency within police departments, access to 911 calls, this is the type of transparency that other states, you mentioned Massachusetts, but other states in addition are already providing. You know, these aren't uh, the, the changes that we're asking for. You know, these aren't uh, unusual things to have in a public records law. Other states have them, and those states are providing the transparency that we're asking for. So, you know, this legislation that we're now considering, it's a very reasonable piece of legislation that should be supported and has many changes in it that we're already seeing in other states mm -hmm. and have been in other state laws for years. During your time leading the coalition, thinking about the region broadly, do you feel like government has become more or less transparent overall? 
Great question, great question. And I think uh, sometimes it depends on what particular part of government we're talking about. Uh, very you know, broad terms, 30,000 foot view, I think the answer, short answer, is that it's becoming more secretive. I think there is some more sensitivity to privacy interests that have had people in government taking a step back and being more reluctant to provide the information that all of us in the public deserve to have. Uh, that said, on the other side, you know, there is some, I think, inclination for transparency because we're seeing across the country more of a push for, particularly in law enforcement agencies, to have more transparency, to get a better understanding as to how these government agencies are working. And I think that momentum really is being seen you know, across the states. That's why we're seeing more laws being changed to give us better access to body camera footage, for example, and other uh, you know, dark corners of government that we haven't been able to shine a light on. We're having more momentum, seeing more people rise up and say, hey, we need to see what's going on there. We need that kind of transparency so we can understand how our government's acting on our behalf. So for those parts of government that you say are leaning a little bit more towards secrecy, what do you think is behind that? Is that they're giving more, um, a, a more of a give to the private interests of organizations or, or what exactly is, is driving that? Yeah, I, th I think overall there's this concern for uh, an individual's privacy. And in some circumstances, that's warranted. You know, I value my privacy. I'm sure you do. We all do. We all value our privacy. But what we're talking about here are government institutions, government agencies, and there's less of an expectation of privacy there. Uh, and that's really what we need to focus in on. So overall, I think there is this uh, sensitivity to these you know, individual privacy interests that can make it difficult sometimes to get records from government. But we need to, all of us, you know, as residents of Rhode Island, we all need to say, you know, these records that are important to our understanding of government, and even if there are some privacy interests here that are standing in our way of transparency, our interest in knowing about government and getting that kind of transparency outweighs those privacy interests in most of those cases. Yeah, I also, I've, I've noticed in over, you know, almost a quarter century of reporting that, um, you know, everything, every request is now getting litigated. Everything goes through a city solicitor. Everything goes through some government agency lawyer when 20 years ago, that wasn't the case. It was just uh, you asked for something and, and you would generally get it. And I do wonder sometimes if that is a fallout of the shrinking press corps um, and there's less interaction between. Now, public records laws aren't made for journalists. They're made for the public, but we often use them. And I, and I do wonder if that's sort of a fallout of the sh uh, shrinking press corps. But, you know, when someone is denied just an access to a public record in Rhode Island, the main avenue of appeal is to the attorney general's office which by law is charged with deciding if the government agency violated APRA. Now, one of the biggest roles the AG's office plays is as you know, the state's law firm. They represent state agencies when they go to court, they're getting sued or, or something like that. Is, in your view, is there a conflict there in having state attorneys being this neutral arbiter in public records fights, yet they represent state agencies in, in legal battles, not even to mention their close affiliation with law enforcement? Yeah, I, I think there's a conflict, at least in perception, right? Uh, we need to, as members of the public, we need to have trust in our government institutions. When it comes to public records law, we need to make sure that the attorney general's office is uh, defending our interests and transparency. So I think given the other roles that the office has, certainly there's at least a, a conflict uh, as far as the, the perception that there might be a conflict of interest there. Um, I will say it's not on, uh, this situation isn't unusual. There are other states that are set up similarly where mm -hmm. you have the AG's office overseeing the, the public records law. But other it's, states do it differently, particularly to our north and our south, right? I mean, what is Connecticut has a commission? So, yeah, so there are some examples. Connecticut is uh, always the first one to note because they have a third party commission completely uh, almost completely independent, state-funded, but it act, operates independently, and that hears uh, public records disputes and makes decisions, and those decisions are actually binding. They're enforceable. So if somebody doesn't have the, the time and the money to take a dispute to court, they can go to the commission, they can get a decision, and then that decision, again, is enforceable, um, you know, different than, than other states. We go to Massachusetts, we have a, a supervisor of records there that, uh, that hears disputes and issues decisions, in the Secretary of State's office? In the Secretary of State's okay. office. But um, the flaw there, and no system's perfect, but the flaw there is that those, system, the, those uh, decisions aren't enforceable. Ultimately, you need to either take that case to court or have the Attorney General, again, in Massachusetts, um, enforce that decision on your behalf. 
other states, you go to Maine, you go to New Hampshire, uh, you don't have any kind of uh, third party uh, uh, mediating these disputes. Mm -hmm. You just simply have to take these to court yourself. So again, there isn't a perfect system that we can point to, but we can take some guidance, particularly from Connecticut and Massachusetts, as far as how we might be able to um, restructure the system here in Rhode Island to make it better. We have just about a minute left here, Justin, so I'm going to ask you one other thing that I, I know you've been involved with. Uh, look, one good thing out of the pandemic was remote access to public meetings. That has ended, um, and there's a bill right now that would kind of turn back the clock to 2020 in some ways, right? Yeah, that's right. So um, a lot of states, including Rhode Island right now, are trying to figure out how to take that silver lining from the pandemic, remote access, and make it permanent moving forward. And by remote access, I really mean hybrid access. How can we create a system where citizens can both go to a government meeting in person and get the face-to-face -face time with their representatives that they deserve? We have about 30 seconds left. But can also... Uh, from home or from any other remote location also come into that meeting and be there and be present and engage. It's a, a matter of just making a, that, that democracy more equitable for everybody. Yeah, and uh, again, we have a series of resources on NEFAC, nefac.org for people yep. who uh, want to check that out and get educated on public records laws and a whole bunch of other things. Justin Silverman from the New England First Amendment Coalition, we really appreciate your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Our first half guest was Neil Steinberg from the Rhode Island Foundation. If you missed any of it. It's on WPRI.com. Don't forget to sub, uh, subscribe to our podcast. For Eli Sherman, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.